Hello and welcome to Time with Pastor Otabel, our interactive discussion program that throws the light of scripture on the notable issues of our lives. My name is Albert Okran and it's a joy to welcome you on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otabel. Last week we began a discussion on Africa and God's purpose and it's a joy to continue that discussion today, leading the discussion and bringing us answers. It's my joy to welcome Pastor Mensa Otabel. Pastor Otabel, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome last week. Well, we thank God. And we are trusting God to learn again this week. Amen. Amen. Let me welcome my colleagues, Reverend Eric Helmer, crew of ICG's Open Heavens. Pastor Eric, last week was just beautiful. That's very important. That's good. Thank yes. you very much, but, but, Pastor Albert. And then Pastor Priscilla, ICG's Eagles Temple. Pastor Priscilla, good to see you. Thank you, Pastor Albert. So, Doc, last week we laid the foundation focusing largely on black presence in the scriptures. Today, we'll be exploring themes that revolve around colonialism, slavery, and the notion of race superiority. Let's start with a simple question about whether God has special dealings with any particular race apart from his covenant relationship with Israel. Well, God God created all people. And so on that basis, he has special relations with every body with every race, with every people group. There is no superior race in God's hierarchy on earth. So uh, even his relationship with Israel does not make them superior to other nations. It was simply because they were the nation through whom he was bringing his revelation to the rest of the world. But it didn't confer on them any superiority to in any um, any any other race for, for that matter. Um, if you even look at God's relationship with Israel, uh, he rebuked them when he had to. Uh, this is a nation that went into slavery. This is a nation that has suffered. Um, and you don't see anything in God's dealings with Israel that would indicate that they are superior to other races. But you see that uh, in terms of his his covenant relationship with human beings and the unveiling of the Messiah, uh, he was going to come from that, that group. And, and that's pretty much uh, God's relationship with them. That's a very important foundation for today. Pastor Priscilla? Yes, so Doc, what is the origin then of race superiority? And where is this notion originating that one race is God's first choice and the other's a beneficiary of humanity's leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's not in the Bible. Um, human beings will always use one difference or the other against the other person. Um, the, the notion of using the color of the skin as a basis of differentiation is quite a recent one. Um, what used to be the practice would be uh, language, tongue. Uh, and so the language you spoke was what gave you away as from a different group of people. Um, which tribe you belong to, uh, also set you out. Uh, but then, especially during the introduction of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, that is when color of skin became a major factor for differentiation and, and valuation and devaluation. Uh, but uh, in the biblical days, you find it wasn't a major uh, factor for determining superiority. Yes, different groups thought they were superior. Uh, of course, when, when the Babylonians ruled the world, they thought they were better than everybody else. When the Assyrians ruled, they thought they were better than everybody else. The Romans thought they were better than everybody else. The Greeks thought so. So uh, any time a society became the predominant society, uh, they, they think that they are better. In Ghana, we, we, we have an, our north-south divide where one group thinks they are better off than the other. Human beings, even if you put two uh, brothers and sisters together, they would look for a difference and try to make the difference uh, a value system. Uh, but the Bible does not set out racial or skin tone as a basis for differentiation. Right. Well, there's this notion that Christianity was the white man's religion imported 
into Africa. But last week you made a point that Christianity was in Africa pre-colonial times. Can you expand a bit on that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's an offhand comment people make that Christianity is a white man's religion. Um, and sometimes we make it without really examining the historical accuracy of that. Neither do we uh, examine the philosophical accuracy of that. Um, I mean, what do we mean by white man? That is the first thing we, we have to really uh, find out. Uh, but I think in our world today, when we say white man, we mean European, uh, whether European in Europe or European in their diaspora, mostly in the United States and Canada. Uh, normally, when we say white man, we don't even include the Asians into what we call white man. Um, so if we're defining white man as European, then Christianity cannot, under any circumstance, be the religion of the European. Uh, historically, uh, Christianity, as I said, started from the ancient Near East and, uh, and moved within that space. It, it was uh, in Africa before it went to, to Europe. The Europeans embraced Christianity later um, and owned it, especially Europeans. Uh, if you take the Romans out and the Greeks out, uh, European in terms of Britain, France, Germany, these were way later uh, uh, entrance to Christianity after the fall of the Roman Empire uh, when the, the message of the gospel got to them. So uh, I, I don't really know why anybody would say Christianity is a white man's religion. The, the, the Europeans had their religion. The, the British had their Druidism, and they had all kinds of religions before Christianity went there. The, the thing to, to notice about Christianity is that wherever it goes, it disrupts what was there. Even for the Jews, out of which Christianity came, it disrupted Judaism because Jesus Christ uh, confronted the, the, some of the assumptions of their society. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the major religious leaders, were not the, the accepted philosophy of Jesus Christ. So even among Jews... Christianity disrupted it, uh, their primary religion. When it went to the Roman world, it disrupted them. When it went to the Greek world, it disrupted them. It went to Britain, it disrupted them. Wherever Christianity goes, it, it disrupts what was there. The reason is simply because Christianity is God's revelation. So when it comes, whatever pre-existed has to be disrupted. Uh, the Bible says in the times of ignorance, God winked. So every society had a time of ignorance, from the Jews to the Romans, to the Greeks, to the British, to us Africans. There was a time of ignorance. We believe in Christianity. Christ is the full revelation of God. And once he comes, the shadow must leave for the reality to, to take ownership. And, and so if it disrupted us, we're not unique. It disrupted everybody. Uh, of course, it, uh, it was said in the book of Acts uh, when the early apostles went to, to, they would say that the people who have turned the world upside down have come to this place because their message was revolutionary and it wasn't adaptive to any culture. It had to change every culture. Doc, the evangelization of Africa by Europe came with colonialism, but also with slavery and racism. How do we decouple them? What are the points of convergence and the points of divergence? The Europeans did not set out to colonize. The efforts that started in the 1400s uh, was to explore. And basically, they were looking for routes to India. And uh, part of the route came through West Africa, through Cape of Good Hope in South Africa to India. And they had to find another route to India uh, which led to the Americas. Um, for us here, uh, that was our first interaction uh, with these traders coming from, from Europe. I don't think they had a mind to colonize or to enslave, but eventually uh, slavery and colonialism resulted from several dynamics. It, it happened, and we can look at how all of that happened, but just to summarize, it happened. Um, 
so th there are three aspects of the European effort that we have to look at. The trade effort, which is pure trading, uh, and they traded with us bringing guns and so on. Not good for us, but uh, they brought guns to gold. Eventually, uh, it led into human trafficking. And then, so that's trade. Then there is a political when they settled and started to build colonies and expanded the colonies. Uh, and in Ghana, eventually led to uh, the whole nation uh, coming under them. Um, and then there is the missionary effort. The missionary effort was more like a social aspect of it. Uh, so if you are trading and you are ruling, then let us provide some support. Let's provide religious faith and let's provide education and health and, and so on. So uh, these three were going on. They are not all the same, although they came from the same source and they didn't always agree. Because the church effort most of the time fought the, the trade and the political effort. Uh, that's why the uh, anti-slavery drive was almost always a church drive. Uh, the anti-colonial drive was a church drive. The anti-apartheid drive was a church drive. Because the church was a redemptive strand in this process that Europe introduced to Africa. So I would say that the seeds of colonialism and slave, slavery's defeat were sown right at the time it began, and it was sown through the church. Uh, so once the church entered, the redemptive process uh, had been engaged, and eventually the church became the, the arm that uh, dismantled both the, the colonial and, to an extent, the trade dynamics. Doc, um, many people visit Africa's slave forts and castles and they cringe at the very thought of a chapel literally sitting above the slave dungeons. How would you address people who, ha who struggle with Christianity because of this imagery? The message of Christ finds itself in very unlikely places. Um, if, if, if a church goes to do a mission in a brothel, in a house of prostitutes, would we say the church is encouraging prostitution? No. It has to have a presence in the darkest spot of human history. Uh, there are churches that go to prisons. And, and so when you go to prisons in Ghana now, there are churches there. Church building, prison ministries, are they perpetrating imprisonment? No. They are the redemptive arm. So to see the church in the midst of this dark history is not to make the church a part or a colluder, but the church as a humanizer. Because if the church is absent, it, there's no salt, there's no light in society. And the church operates in the darkest of places. Now when we look at it from a distance historical point of view, we, we put it all together and just say, well, they use the church to do that. Um, but that's not exactly what happened. Was the church always guiltless? There will be practitioners of the church who probably crossed the line and were guilty. But the church always goes to a place as a redeeming force. And the church must operate in the most depraved environment. And that's why you have churches operating in squalor. You have churches operating in leprosariums. You have churches operating in prisons. Uh, churches trying to do outreaches to brothels, to drunkards. Uh, we are not there to endorse it. The church is there to, to try and salvage what is left after the political forces have done their job. I think that this is phenomenal. Mm. Um, this time it's always an, a learning experience for me. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Like from the scriptures, slavery has been prominently through, through the scriptures. When you read the scripture, especially Paul made allusion to the fact that bond servants should respect their masters. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, and Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Uh, is that justification for s s s slavery? 
You know, one, one of the dangers of reading past experience with modern eye is that we make characterizations based on our modern understanding which are not historically accurate. That instruction that Paul says uh, the the slave should be subject to, to, to the master also said the master should know that the slave is his brother. You see, the, the whole concept that a slave is your brother is the most radical thought of that era. It, it, you couldn't ever think that a master will sit in the same chair with his slave and see him as brother. So what Christianity actually did was it, it again, disrupted the system. It said that this man you think you own is actually your brother in Christ. You are bought by the same blood of Jesus Christ. You share fellowship with him. You must honor him. You must respect him. Reciprocally, the slave must also respect this person. Now, the church was not trying to overthrow an existing system directly, but it was overthrowing it from within but undermining the sense of superiority and inferiority by the message it was propagating. And no wonder uh, it it was able to disrupt it. So, you know, the church is not like um, a military army that comes head on collision. The church's work is always within, and the results are seen later. So now when we look at it, we say Paul was colluding with slavery, but actually, Paul was dismantling slavery by the instruction he gave that uh, for a Roman to ever imagine that his slave was an equal. You have to understand, in the Roman world, you, you killed your slave and you owed nobody an explanation. You, you, I mean, you, you, you are angry, you just hit him, and he's dead. That's it. He's a property. He, you, you don't explain to anybody. Uh, you sexually abuse a slave, you have nothing There's no explanation. This is the world. And now Paul is saying, this person you think is below you, is an animal, is your brother. And people would take that to mean uh, that he is supporting slavery. That We have to read it within the context it is occurring in, not in the world as it is now. Because our understanding now was not the understanding. This is time with Pastor Otabu, talking today about Africa and God's purpose. We'll go for a brief break. When we come back, Let's explore even more different dynamics of this all-important subject. Please don't go away. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otabo, exploring today Africa and God's purpose. A discussion we began last week and is getting better every single day. Invite somebody to tune in or log on as we open up the scriptures or as we expand their thoughts about this all-important subject. So let's move to or bring it closer home to apartheid, another dark spot in our history. And once again, in the narrative of apartheid, you will see the church seeming to feature again as a facilitator or collaborator? How can we keep appearing in all these narratives? Oh, well, I mean, if, if you look at the story of apartheid, there were certain church ideas or church groups which propagated an idea to support the political agenda. And sometimes it happens when the church sides with a political force. And so uh, certain churches, I don't want to mention by name, uh, su- supported the apartheid effort uh, and try to come up with notions uh, conjured from the Bible, but not taught by the Bible, but conjured from the Bible to establish that uh, the white race was superior to, to the black race. But isn't it amazing that it was overthrown by the church? It took people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu uh, and, and others and uh, most of the anti-apartheid 
uh, leaders were church trained and, and church led people. Even in the colonial effort was, uh, was undermined by church people. Our own Kwame Nkrumah, uh, was, was a seminary trained, uh, person. And that's what people don't understand that much of Nkrumah's liberation philosophy came from his understanding of the scriptures. And, and he was a person who alluded to the scriptures a lot in his thought of liberation. Because you see, you cannot oppress a, a people uh, or keep people under bondage with the book of Exodus in the Bible. I mean, how can you come to terms with the book of Exodus and, and God siding with slaves against an empire and delivering them? I mean, just that book alone upends every notion of, of slavery. And, and so the Bible within itself has a lot of liberation philosophies um, that has enabled black people to be free, whether through apartheid, colonialism, uh, slavery, uh, the civil rights movement. Look at all these movements that were led by clergymen. How come clergymen were leading it? Because the thought of the Bible uh, was the thought that provided the freedom and the philosophy, the philosophical undergirding for the freedom that black people have fought for, whether through civil rights, through, uh, from apartheid, from colonialism, from slavery, it's always been the Bible. But let's stay briefly with those who you mentioned as distorting the scriptures to make a point to support what agenda that they had. Mm. The question some people ask is, how are people able to so easily sometimes take the Bible and make it say what they want to say, contrary to what the Bible actually means? You can only do that if people are not reading the Bible. You can do that to a society. And all of these happen when the masses couldn't have access to the Bible. Uh, even under slavery, uh, certain portions of the Bible were deliberately removed because if, if a slave read those words, you couldn't keep him under slavery. Uh, uh, slaves were, were not taught to read. They were prevented from reading. Uh, look at uh, in South Africa, the, the whole language policy to deny people the education that was required for them to be able to access knowledge in the right form. You cannot use the Bible to oppress if people can read the Bible. Because some of the ideas are so plain, black and white. If you read the book of Exodus, let my people go. Uh, how are you going to oppress people who are reading Moses, let my people go? It's, it's impossible. And, and, uh, and, and so if you look at the, the, the history of black liberation, the, the Bible and men of the Bible or, and women of the Bible have featured very prominently in the liberation effort. Doc, let's look at contemporary times and um, whether the church has reinforced racism, neocolonialism. I wouldn't, I have to look at specific issues. Uh, as to whether the church in current form uh, affirms that. Um, the church, you know, when we talk about the church, we shouldn't just look at one isolated denomination and its philosophy or one clergyman and what he says. We have to look at the, the church community, the larger church community, to determine the position of the church. and. The church has always, in contemporary times, been on the side of the suffering. The church has always been on the side of the suffering and the marginal. Moses uh, Makachi Tisa from Zimbabwe said that several generations of black have always been behind. How can we change this for the younger generation now? That question is a very heavy question, simple as it is. It's very heavy um, because it asks a very important question about why we are where we are. You know, the story of black people ended up in bondage, one way or the other, on the, on the continent and those who were shipped out of the continent. So the bondage was spread globally. 
to the Caribbean, to South America, uh, Brazil, and other South American countries, to North America, United States, to Canada, to Europe, and then later on, uh, after the Second World War, of Caribbeans, West Indians coming back to Great Britain, uh, and then our story. Wherever you find black people, uh, there is a certain privation that uh, animates our story. It, it's almost as if um, being down has become a, a constant with us. And the question always is, why is it so? I think um, I have clear ideas on why it's so. Um, and I have to be very careful how I express these ideas uh, because they are not the standard ideas. Our effort at developing a philosophy of selfhood and freedom always found its expression in protest. So if you look at the anti-colonial effort, it was a protest because people have done something to us and we were protesting it. So we developed a philosophy that protests but doesn't construct. And it's very important. You find the same thing in the civil rights and movement in the United States. Two major messengers emerged, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, speaking about the same thing in different forms. But both were protesting. We have been mistreated, and so the idea is we have to deal with the one who has mistreated us. If you go to the Caribbean, uh, you find the same thing. A few... Black people, I think, developed a message beyond protest. People like Marcus Garvey um, and a few others, uh, I think, developed a message beyond protest. But eventually, our message is always protest, not self-actualization. So when you see the black struggle, it is always struggling against oppression. Even when we are free, we're still struggling against oppression. We never come to accept our freedom because of how the message began. And also because of how the message began, it left a huge aspect of our lives never examined. That is the pre-colonial, pre-slavery, pre-apartheid Africa. Our worldview was never challenged. We never challenged our worldview. We challenged the incursions of the oppressor who oppressed us. And and so it seems as if we accept that our world and everything we believe and how we assume everything is perfect. The problem is, quote unquote, the white man. Once we make the white man our problem, we can't solve our problem. Because yes, It's part of our problem, but it is a layer of our problem. There is another layer of our problem that is us, which we must confront. But much of African philosophy from academia, our writings, all our major thinking, finds it very difficult to do that self-examination. And if you study any society which has made progress, they make progress by doing internal examination. Not what has happened to them, but who they are and and why who they are contributes to what they have become. And that, I feel, is the big uh, uh, part that we are not addressing. And it, for me, it's, it's, it's at the core of where why we're not making as much progress as we want. Doc, how can the church, the preaching of the gospel, fill this void that you just described, this vacuum in terms of our messaging? 
how can the church or the preaching of the gospel fill that void? Well, you see, when, when we came into contact with quote unquote white people, whether it's in Africa or through slavery, the, one of the things they did was to diminish everything about us. They diminished our history, diminished our culture, they diminished everything, diminished our music, diminished everything. Uh, and part of our response was we have to then honor and elevate everything we have, which is only reactionary because if what you have uh, is problematic, you will never have the chance to examine it because you have to protect it from the one who is trying to abuse it. So you never talk about it. So th- there, there are different ways to deal with it. I mean, sometimes people look at Africa and our past and just rubbish it. And the church sometimes makes that mistake where it doesn't have the sophistication to understand African culture in its ancient form. And we rubbish all of it uh, as if, uh, you know, nothing good is with us. Um, and, And we elevate a Christian form. And most of the time, the Christian form we are elevating is European forms. We elevate them. Um, That is wrong. We can't do that. But we can't also accept everything. So there's a middle line we, we have to. And for me, that middle line is a very slow process of understanding where we came from, its strength and its weaknesses, and trying to reshape it in a modern form for it to be able to deal with modern challenges. And that, I believe, should be the preoccupation of the African intelligentsia to examine itself uh, in a view to make us respond. Uh, The church should participate in that. The church's message, uh, the church always has an appropriate message, but it has to be properly focused where, where, where the problem is. So, Doc, what do you think the role of stories, oral tradition, music, arts, and culture in socializing successive generations of children about race superiority. How can we use this? I I am seeing a a very disturbing trend where the younger generation live in Africa, but they're not African. You know, and when I say they're not African, there is no continuity between the thoughts that built our society and the thoughts they are building with. They they are Africa because, of course, they have African names born here and, uh, and all of that. But philosophically, they have plugged into a different worldview. And most of the time, it's, it's American. And even when they think they are becoming black, because, you know, the American story is not this, us. Even American blacks, are, they are not us. We, we, we are all blacks, but our histories are so different. Superficially, we have the same story, but in reality, we don't. Because one was removed, the other stayed. Just that fact alone changes the dynamics of our story. So. Uh, trying to build a diaspora mindset when you are local uh, can have its own problems. I mean, of course, we share commonality of pain and suffering and, and, and aspiration, but the stories are not the same. So even in trying to imitate their struggle, we have to be careful that we don't undermine our struggle. Because if, for example, you, you, you look at the current big issue, Black Lives Matter, you know, it's black Americans dealing with institutional racism in their country. We don't deal with institutional racism, but we are dealing with other stuff. So, so when we say African lives matter, the people who protest against will not be white people. Because they are not the ones demeaning African life here. And until we get this context well, 
We may even be fighting battles that are not our own. So th th there are serious nuances as to how this African uh, experience has to be uh, appreciated. And my, my view is that the gospel properly contextualized and applied to any society's ills has the power to bring healing to that society. I am totally convinced that it is the power of God unto salvation to every society, to every group of people, every people looking to live the abundant life that Jesus Christ promised can live it because the gospel has the power to, to, to provide it. Doc, are there some things we've done in a particular way that we would need to remove to give our younger generation an even better appreciation or a better chance? I've been thinking all week about the example of you at the age of nine. And I'm thinking, okay, reading from Beyond the Rivers of Ethiopia, there was a story about various people being thrown into mud and the ones that came out the darkest. And really, when we're young, we'll be told that when you're going to church and you see the white man, you've seen God, you'll see a picture of the white Jesus. Several artistic expressions, the narrative has always been one is better than the other. How do we change this so that our younger ones coming up have a better appreciation of who they are and what they represent? From a Christian point of view, I think that the, the most important thing is for people to, to know Jesus Christ as Lord, to commit to him, and to commit to live his life. Uh, that by itself, without black consciousness or African consciousness or whatever consciousness, that knowledge by itself is empowering. That experience is very empowering. Uh, but the, the church also has to help people to look at now that Christ is in our hearts, how do we live out his life in the society we live in? And, and that is something, especially as African people. You know, um, when my children were young, I was very careful the kinds of toys I bought for them. I was very careful. Those days, uh, you know, uh, I would fish out for dolls. Uh, that had their skin pig pigmentation, that, that were dark brown, uh, and, and let them play with it. Because I wanted them to see beauty not in a foreign complexion, but within their own complexion. Uh, the heroes that I bought for them, books I bought for them, uh, were all consciously trying to make them comfortable in their skin. Not, not just for them to say, oh, I'm black and I'm better. It's just to say, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay, and, 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 and within my world, I am okay. I, I don't need to try to be somebody else in order to be okay. I'm okay as I am, and God loves me as I am. Indeed, God loves us just as we are. This is time with Pastor Otago. We'll go for another break. When we come back, it will be your chance to ask your questions. And last week, we sent loads of them for Pastor Otago. Please don't go away. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otabu, a discussion about Africa and God's purpose. And we have a number of questions for your attention, Pastor Otabu, starting with Alan Ahima Danso, who says, since God created us all, why do you have such a strong passion for black Africans? And how can one thread the needle between love for all and love for blacks? Oh, um, you can't love anybody if you hate yourself. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. Self-love is very important to transfer to other people. The value you have for yourself is the value you extend to other people. If you abuse yourself, you're going to abuse people. If you don't like yourself, you're not going to like anybody else. 
being conscious of who you are is not to establish superiority, but to correct wrong information that has been culturally and uh, educationally passed on. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes even theologically passed on. So those have to be corrected. It doesn't, it, you're not trying to say you're better than anybody. You're just trying to say, listen, th- these things I've heard about my race and my kind of people uh, are not right. You know, years ago, I preached a, a message. Um, I used to be very strong uh, with, with these messages. And, uh, and a white guy, came to see me, and he was very disturbed. He says, well, uh, the way you preach is, I see we are not in the Bible. I said, well, you're in the Bible. I mean, we always thought you were in the Bible. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying that we're also in the Bible. And, and he says, you know, but isn't this a divisive message? Isn't it racism in reverse? And, you know, kinds of things people say. So I said to him, you know, my brother, I'm going to ask you a very honest question, and I want you to answer me honestly. I said, when you were growing up, the image you have of Jesus that was that he was black and angels are black people and God himself is a black uh, would you worship God he stood for a while and he says no I couldn't have I said so you can understand what we are dealing with I'm not saying Jesus is black and God is black I'm saying that you have imposed a cultural idiom on my perception of my spiritual life and you want me to be comfortable with it and not challenge it, especially when it is not historically accurate. You know, so it's people feel uncomfortable and think you're trying to diminish other people. No, we're trying to just say that this narrative we have is not accurate, and it, it has to be accurate, and and we have to worship God accurately, not a false god. So, on the lighter side, it will seem that images are very powerful in communicating complex truths. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you notice, um, uh, you would rarely find me with a picture of Jesus or a representation yeah. of Jesus yeah. uh, that is white skin. You know, if I have to represent Jesus in any form, he's going to look like my race. Which is both uh, historically uh, I, uh, and, and socially accurate. Because Jesus Christ was a Palestinian Jew of 2,000 years ago, and he was not Caucasian. <laughs> William from Matahiko wants to know the extent you are ready to go with the gospel of Christ towards the liberation of Africa from antiquity to modern technology. Uh, I think that's what we're trying to do. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and I'm, I'm not a redeemer. I'm not a messiah. I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. I'm only sharing what I have spent quite a sizable part of my life seriously interrogating. Uh, these are not ideas. I just came back life, last year. Uh, I've written on it. I've spoken extensively. I have delivered lectures on them. I have done research. Um, so it's, it's an area that I, I have engaged at least. Um, in a continuous way, I'll say for 45 years, um, I have really been in this space. So I, I understand the African and black phenomenon uh, quite deeply. And, and not only from an African point of view, I've studied the histories of, of black people in the Caribbean, black people in the United States. I understand all of the dynamics of it. I've, I've read, I've studied, I've visited, I've walked in places. Um, I've examined um, records, and I've done quite extensively on this subject. So um, I understand a bit, but I don't understand all, and, and I don't know it all. Uh, uh, so we, all of us must play our role to, to, to make the gospel of Christ real to the experience of the black people. Right. Ian Bernard says, how big is the link between where a person is born and his or her religious beliefs? That's a question that comes up. Uh, would you be a Christian if you were born in a Muslim country? And, I mean, would that be? My, my answer is that God has, from the scriptures, as I understand them now, and I can only relate to what I know now, um, God has predestined 
all men to salvation. It's not the will of God that any should perish. So Christianity does not claim that if you don't become a Christian, you will not be acceptable to God. Christianity claims that God has provided Christ as the Savior and faith in him and his finished work gives you salvation. Um, and I believe that th- that message is believed in and can be believed in by people, no matter where they are in whatever geographical location. Uh, I know people who are, have received Christ but keep a form of their religion. Because of all kinds of complications, they keep the form. But in their heart, Jesus Christ is Lord, and they, they serve him totally and honestly. There are people who, who know that uh, their salvation depends on Christ. And yet, apparently, when you see them, they may seem to be practitioners of a religion that is not Christian. Uh, because we, we have to be careful not uh, to uh, sideline people from the core of the gospel. The central gospel is Christ, not Christianity, Christ Jesus, the Savior of the world. As Malcolm said, central gospel. (laughs) That's why our church is called Central Central Gospel Gospel Church. This is Christ, Christ, the center of the gospel. Look, you talked about being in this space for several years. So Jonathan Boche of North Carolina goes back to the 90s and to Bahamas, where he taught on reawakening of the black man. He says, At the tail end of that message, the power of God broke in a way he had not seen before with several prophecies about the black race. He says, looking back today, would you say these prophecies have manifested um, today? Prophecies are very interesting things. Some of them take more time than you would want them to. I mean, from the Bible, we see them. Uh, You think it's going to happen today, and then it takes a hundred years, and it takes a thousand years. (laughs) So. Once God has spoken, we know it will come to pass. So we hope it comes to pass quickly in our time. Okay, but the benefit it, of those of us who are not there, what, what did the prophecies say would happen? Oh, I, you know, the, the, that time was a very interesting time in black history. And uh, I mean, I spoke for my dear friend, uh, Miles Monroe. Um, this would be probably 91 thereabouts. And it was a convergence for a lot of uh, black people from the Caribbean, from Africa, from America. And there was hope of a transformation. Part of it, I feel, has, ha- has happened. Uh, the emergence of black America uh, in, within that time was, has been very significant. Um, even from the church world, ministries that burst forth, because there were no black ministries then, um, apart from a few people. But the, the, one of the prophecies was really the spiritual emergence of Africa and West Africa, for that matter. Um, and, um, and we've seen it. I mean, the last 20 or 25 years, the, the, the church effort in West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana particularly, has been quite a, a revelation. I mean, things happening in these two countries that didn't used to happen. So, so much has happened. The explosion of the, of the word of God and the work of God. Um, so those I, I've seen happen. Um, I, I think the transformation, economic transformation, we are yet to see. It. Uh, so those are aspects that we are yet to see. Abraham Hansen is asking that, do you still believe that black people around the world can become economic giants rather than wasters of resources? Uh, You know, I know know black people feel sometimes very disappointed in themselves. We feel disappointed in our governments. We're disappointed in, in ourselves, you know, because it looks like we're not making effort. Uh, or making much progress. I think that sometimes you can be making progress without seeing you are making progress because you are in the system together. Um, So if you look at different places in the world, I mean, we've had a, a black person as president of the United States. I mean, 
40 years ago, it was totally unimaginable. But it's happened. And, uh, and uh, it's happened. And so, so, so much has happened. Um, we've seen uh, African countries breaking out from a cycle of coup d'etats and instability where nothing was happening. Yes, we are not making as much progress as we should, but we're better than in the 70s. Uh, thank God we don't have people like Emperor Bokasa as president or uh, Field Marshal Idi Amin and others like that. I mean, yeah, they, we don't have perfect leaders now, but look at where Africa was in the 70s and, and where we are now. It's, it's day and night. Uh, so it's slow. Um, but it's it's happening. Uh, my my view is, you know, sometimes when we read history books, five hundred years can be compressed in a chapter, so it will look as if things were happened just like. That. But it's because you're looking back. So it will happen. It's happening, and it will happen. It will happen. So final question: What has given you the most joy in this whole pursuit, in this whole vision for Black Awakening? What has in the past few decades given you the biggest joy as a proponent? I, I think the church in Africa has been very inspirational to me. I know all the problems. I'm part of it. I understand all the limitations. I, I get it when we get bashed and, and, and people express so much disappointment. Uh, because of all the shades and the colors and all the expressions and all the excesses, I get it. I'm not uh, minimizing. But if you take a second look at this movement, that is just about 40 years, 40, 45, and what it has achieved in the 45 years of its life. I think it's probably the most remarkable social development effort on our continent and probably in our history for a very long uh, the, the massive nature of what has been accomplished. It, it's, it's, um, it's humbling. It's humbling. Look at it properly as from a developmental point of view to see a group that used to be in a classroom 40 years ago, now global all over the world, building huge institutions, uh, sustaining huge activities. I mean, if you look at the scale, it's, it doesn't happen. It's, it's almost the same way we get overwhelmed looking at the scale of Amazon or looking at the scale of Facebook or looking at the scale of Apple computers and just see how students 40 years ago have grown their enterprises. The same thing has happened in the church. It's just that it's church and people insult it and diminish it and devalue it and never pay attention to even examine it properly. Yes, take all the excesses off, but examine the progression and the trajectory and you would see that something has happened right before our eyes that is as amazing as all the developmental stories we tell. And if anything has given me so much pride, it's the African church. This is time with Pastor Otago, a conversation that is always so inspirational that we look forward to every single week. A big thank you to you, Pastor Tolo, for the instruction, the answers, the inspiration that has come from this interaction. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you to you, Pastor Eric, for your contribution to this discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Tesla, for thank making you. time once again. Thank you, Pastor Alvin. So definitely there's so much more we need to look at with black emancipation or and, and black African people and God's purpose. But today, as we wrap up, what would be your message? to our viewers reaching out and believing as they look into the future. And if you could also pray with us as we wrap up today. Well, I mean, for every African, we, we feel late. We feel we are behind. 
and we have to run extremely fast. And so we are impatient with ourselves and we want to do better. And I believe we will do better. And especially for the young people. Um, if there's anything I wish, I wish I was 30 years old. Uh, with what I know now, uh, I think I would, I would be happier with a 30-year-old version of me with my understanding. But that's not possible. So I pray for you, those of you who are young people, that God will give you extraordinary capacity, extraordinary wisdom, extraordinary brains and minds and understanding. Because you're going to do things that your fathers couldn't do. You're going to do things your grandparents couldn't do. You're going to do things that nobody has ever done. You're going to achieve things in your lifetime that, Today is almost like an imagination. Your generation is going to be the, the one who tells the story of Africa in this marvelous way. And I pray for you that God will enable you. He grants you wisdom and favor and influence, everything you need to become the people that he has called you to be. In Jesus' name, amen. 